notice that students have a lot of difficulty when you discuss or talk about expressions versus equations. So I want you to see the difference. Um, in your discussion post, you asked to you know talk about the uh, solving express uh, equations, solving polynomial equations. So um, you know a lot of students, what they do, I noticed, is you know they simply take you know a polynomial and they talk about factoring and they leave it at that. But you're not solving anything. You're just representing your polynomial as a factored form. You're not solving for x. Your uh, equation has to have an equal sign. That's why we call it an equation. Now these are just different um, polynomial equations that I randomly made up and, and determined. Um, but notice the difference between you know my factoring videos versus this one where I talk about an equation. I have an equal sign. Every single example that you're going to see me do has an equal sign. It is a statement now. I have a statement of equality. This one I was just making up. So maybe this part's not. Yeah, I have a statement of equality. So <clears throat> how do I solve an equation? Okay, what are the solutions? What are the values of x that make this statement true? This is an equation. Okay. Please don't make that mistake. I see it all the time. So I'm going to do a couple. Uh, I think I have four examples. And here's my first polynomial equation already set up for me in standard form, set equal to zero. If it is not equal to zero, that is the first step, right? You want to always set it equal to zero. Make the right-hand side zero. Then you have to think about all the different factoring methods that you have. You know, trial and error, factoring a trinomial, GCF, greatest common factor, Factor by grouping, special factoring, difference of squares. All these different um, situations can occur. You have to be able to identify which situation it is. So here's my first case. I'm setting it equal to zero. What are the values of x that make this statement true? This is a nice quadratic. It's a second degree polynomial. It's in standard form. Um, it's a nice little bi uh, trinomial. The leading coefficient is 1, which makes it a very easy factoring situation. It's like, uh, like in my examples, I talk about backwards foiling. Um, you know, what are the two things that multiply to give me this? And then what are the two things that multiply to give me this? And then I verify with my outer and inner. So give me numbers that multiply to give me 14. I'm going to try a 7 and a 2. And in what situation can I, you know, make it such that the outer and the inner portion is going to add up to give me negative 5? Well, a negative 7 and a positive 2 will do that. If I want to verify that this is factored correctly, I'll multiply my first two terms to check the first term. I'll multiply my second two terms, or the last terms, right? This is, remember, this is F and this is L and this is O plus I in your FOIL. So check the last two terms. Negative 7 times 2 is negative 14. And then your outer is positive 2x. And your inner is negative 7x, which will add up to give you negative 5x. And therefore, this is factored correctly. Um, I'm not always going to show all that, but that's how we did it in trial and error method. But you're not done. All you did was factor it. Now you have the statement that this is equal to 0. So how do you determine these values of x? Now, why is it so important that you make it equal to 0? You're going to use the zero product property, um, what we call the zero product property after factoring. And what it says and what it talks about is the fact that if you have two numbers or two things that multiply to give you zero, let's just say a times b is zero, right? If this is true, then a has to be zero or b has to be zero. One of these things has to be zero or both to make this a true statement. I can't multiply two things and get zero unless somebody's zero, right? Why does it have to be zero? Well, what if I have two numbers and multiply to give me four? I can come up with infinite different combinations, infinite different you know, pairs of numbers that multiply to give me four. Two times two, four times one, one times four, one fourth times you know, 16. I can, fraction, decimal. I can come up with so many different options to make this true that I can't determine what a and b is. But if this product is equal to zero, I know for sure that one of these guys has to be zero. That's why the zero product property is so important, and that's why you always want to make sure that it is equal to zero before you do any factoring, okay? So now, 
because this product is equal to zero, then that means that either the first portion can be zero or the second portion can be zero. Hmm, you solve these little basic equations, add seven to both sides, so I get x is seven or subtract two from both sides, x is negative two. Two cases, two answers, it's a second degree polynomial. Okay, these are my answers. These are my solutions. These are the values of x that make this statement true. I'm not simply factoring, I am solving an equation. That is the difference between just an expression and representing it in factored form versus solving an actual equation. Um, let's do this one. Notice that the right hand side does not have a zero. So I'm gonna subtract four for both sides. So now I'm gonna have a 15x squared plus 17x minus four is equal to zero. Now I have zero on the right hand side. And now I see a trinomial in standard form which I'm going to see if it factors using my trial and error method. Um, remember that this is the, uh, let me write it in green. This is the F part of FOIL. This is the L part of FOIL. This is the outer plus the inner. So using that knowledge, I'm going to play with numbers a little bit, okay, and see if it, uh, I can get it to work. First part of FOIL, what times what is 15x squared? Well, I'm going to try a 5x and a 3x. This looks like a 3, it's not a 3. I don't know why my fives look like threes. Okay. Um, the last part. What two numbers give me negative four? I don't know. Try stuff. Let's try a two and a two. Now let's see if that works. Trial and error. Check it with my outer, which is 10x, and my inner, which is negative 6x. 10 and a 6 will never give me 17 no matter how I do it. So therefore, this is incorrect. Right? I'm going to change these numbers. Now, if I switch the 2 and the 2, that doesn't make a difference because they're both the same. So I'm going to try different factors of 4 to see if I can get it to work. Um, what other factors of 4 do I have? Well, I have a 4 and a 1. Let's try that. Um, all right, my outer is going to give me a 5x, and my inner is going to give me a negative 12x. Which, ah, a 5 and a 12 could potentially give me a 17 if they're both positive. But the problem is I can't make them both positive because I need the product to be negative. So my signs are not working with this situation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try the one here and the four there and see if that works. Now I hope you practice this enough to the point where you get, you know, you get really good and you can kind of do your outer and inner by just looking at it. And it, like I said, it takes practice. Outer is 20x, inner is negative 3x, there it is. 20 minus 3 is 17. I have my negative 4 where I want it to be. So 5x times 3x is 15x squared. Negative 1 times positive 4, let me make that a positive 4, is equal to negative 4. Um, and then the outer and inner combine to give me what I need in the middle. So this is factored correctly now, but I'm not done because I'm solving an equation. If I were simply factoring it or representing the expression in factored form, I would be done, but I am not. I want to solve this. What values of x make this true? So I have a product equal to zero, which means that the first portion or part of the product could be zero, or the second part could be zero, in order to make this a true statement. So I have these little equations to solve, not bad. Add one to both sides, um, subtract four from both sides. I'm kind of doing both in one shot. Five X is equal to one. Three X is equal to negative four. And then I'll divide both sides by five here. Divide both sides by three here. Running out of space. <laughs> I have 5 divided by 5 is 1, x is equal to 1 fifth, and that is my first possible answer. x is equal to negative 4 thirds, and that is my second possible answer. Two solutions for a second degree polynomial. Okay? Okay, let's look at this one. Again, it is an equation. It's an equal sign. The first thing that I'm going to do is set it equal to 0. So that means I'm going to subtract 16 from both sides. 
this is one method to solve this, and we're going with the factoring method. So now, <clears throat> this is a binomial, right? It's not a trinomial like in the other examples. So I'm going to try a special factoring method. Is it a difference of squares? Well, it looks like something squared. And actually, let me kind of go along with what I did in my video. Um, is it a difference of squares? What did I do? I said, can I represent it as something squared minus something squared? Well, yeah, this is a 7x and this is a 4, which means it follows the difference of squares pattern, which means I can factor it using that pattern and say that the first two terms are 7x and 7x, and the last two terms are 4 and 4, and I have a plus and a minus. Check it if you need to. I'm solving an equation, so I'm not done. I have a product equal to 0, which means that the first term could be 0, or the second term could be 0. So now I have to these, uh, solve these two little equations, um, minus 4, plus 4, I'll do them separately. So I have 7x on the left and negative 4 on the right. And over here I have 7x on the left and positive 4 on the right. I'm solving two separate equations. Divide both sides by 7. That's a 7. <laughs> and now I have two solutions. And x is equal to negative 4 over 7, which can't be simplified. And x is equal to positive 4 over 7. Two solutions. Some, you know, some polynomials have more solutions. These are second degree polynomials, so I'm expecting two solutions. Sometimes they're different, sometimes they're repeated. Um, so I showed you, you know, you're factoring with like trial and error, your difference of squares, and then I want to do one of these. This is a potential, let's see if you can recognize it. Um, well, before I actually think about factoring it, obviously I am not set equal to zero. So the first thing that I want to do is bring these guys over here. So I'm going to subtract 9x to the third from both sides. And I'm going to subtract 18x squared from both sides. So what that does is makes all this cancel on the right. So setting equal to zero. And on the left, I can't necessarily combine them, so I'm just going to write it in standard form. x to the fifth plus 2x to the fourth minus 9x to the third minus, it's a minus, 18x squared. So now I have my nice polynomial equation represented. So now I have to think about how to factor this. So my trial and error is not going to work, right? I don't have three terms. My difference of squares is not going to work. That's what this was. Special factoring. Difference of squares is a binomial. I don't have the perfect square trinomial in this example, but that's also a special factoring. But you can factor those with these methods as well. Um, I have four terms, so I'm going to see if factor by grouping works. Let's see. I'm not sure yet because not every polynomial can be done with this method. But because there are four terms, I'm going to see if it works. But before I even do that, I do notice that I have a GCF. Every single term has an x squared in common. So you're always going to start with a GCF if you have it. And when I take it out, I think I did this in one of my other videos. When I take it out, this is where I'm at. So factor um, GCF first if you have one. Then I said I'm going to see if factor by grouping works. So I have group 1, group 2 with this random like x squared out here. Let's just bring that down. So this is by itself. Now let's focus on group one and group two. In group one, what's my you know, GCF? Well, another x squared in group one. And when I take out an x squared in group one, I'm left with an x plus two. In group two, I take out a negative nine. That's what's in common between negative nine x and negative 18. And when I do that, I'm left with an x plus two. Okay, so here I am. Um, factor by grouping, remember I said your goal is to get that common binomial, which is what happened here. And so therefore, let me bring this down. I can factor out the common binomial. 
And when I do that, I take out the x plus 2, I'm left with an x squared. So I've got the x plus 2 minus 9. So here I am. Oh my goodness. That's going to look horrible sarcastic. <laughs> x squared minus 9 is a special factoring case. It is a difference of squares. So I'm still going x squared times x plus 2 times, this is a difference of squares, x plus 3 times x minus 3. Whew! I am finally completely factored for this guy. This was my special case. I think I did this one in my other video with factor by grouping, you know, where if you have a GCF first, you have to take it out, it, you know, start there, make your life easier. Factor by grouping. Sometimes when you factor by grouping, other situations pop up, like in this one, a difference of squares. Now, I do not have a product of two things equal to zero, but a product of one, two, three, four uh, different things equal to zero means that either the first could be zero or the second can be zero or the third can be zero or the fourth. I have four different little equations to solve now to get all my solutions. Now, x squared equal to zero, this is easy. This is an x times x equal to zero, which means, you know, your solution is x is zero. x plus two is zero. Subtracting two from both sides, I get x is negative two. x plus three is zero. Subtracting three from both sides, I get negative three. And x minus three is zero. Adding three to both sides, I get positive three. Now look, I have one, two, three, four solutions. Now technically I have five of them because this one is repeated twice, right? X is zero and X is zero because the product of these two is zero. So technically I have one, two, three, four, five total solutions. Just one of them is repeated, which happens to match the degree. That is not a coincidence. The total number of solutions that you have to a polynomial equation should match the degree of the polynomial. If it's repeated, then count it that many times. So two solutions here, it's a second degree polynomial. Two solutions here, it's a second degree polynomial. Um, two solutions here, it's a second degree polynomial. One, two, three, four, five, I'm counting zero twice because it's repeated twice. Five solutions here, it's a fifth degree polynomial. Again, these are polynomial equations. Don't confuse this with simply factoring an expression, okay? The process in solving the polynomial equation involves factoring, but you are not done when you're factored. You have to continue and use the zero product property.